Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Mark and I thank you so much for coming by today. Whenever we put ourselves on a public stage for others to see, we open ourselves up to praise, indifference, and criticism. It's true for a music performance, a gallery exhibition, or even right here on YouTube. It's very easy for people to come, observe, and express their opinions. Most people simply take it all in and walk away without much of a word. Others will take the time and express their thoughts and what they took away from it. And then there are those who lend their deeper impressions and insights. This is all very normal and to be expected. Yet, there are still some others who have an unrestrained need to present a more intense, critical point of view. Their unsolicited opinions are typically negative and attempt to challenge, correct, expose, or undermine our efforts. Their feedback is designed to make us react, to make us defensive, question ourselves or our abilities, or make us feel small. But why? Why do some people draw the negative from what should be a positive experience? For years, we've seen people get paid extremely well for their critiques on music, movies, food, and fashion. The difference with them is that they're usually very well educated and have a unique insight into their field. But when it comes to the layperson like you and I, one has to ask the same question. Why do people draw negative from what should be a positive experience? While the truth may not be clear, there may be some surface reasons. Maybe to make them feel better about themselves or their own work? Maybe to undermine the efforts of others for some personal agenda? Or maybe to prove they're right and that they know more than other people? I've worked with a lot of skilled designers in my career, but one stands out more than others. He was a mediocre designer at best who was always sarcastic and cynical. In our team meetings, he would throw coworkers under the bus, pointing out their flaws and telling them how to fix their work. No one valued his feedback, and our manager would just roll her eyes. Of course, if anyone critiqued his work, he'd get very defensive and dismiss anything constructive. His negative attitude and churlish demeanor affected everyone. One day, after an argument with someone in marketing, our manager fired him. He then went on social media and told everyone that he'd quit and that our company was a joke and we were all bad designers. From his perspective, he was a victim. In professional art and design, there's no room to take criticism personally. There's also no room to linger on praise either. You're only as good as your last piece or your last campaign. So for a coworker to throw others under the bus for no good reason, it showed me how some people embrace negativity to elevate themselves, just the way other people elevate themselves through positive efforts. I also learned that there are ways to take negative, harsh criticism without letting it get to me, to look at where it was coming from, not to engage the intent, and to respond respectfully and professionally. I also taught myself to eliminate three words from my professional vocabulary, think, believe, and feel. While these words are still viable, eliminating them removes the emotional content from a discussion and sticks to the facts. Someone saying, I think the colors are too bright, is a subjective opinion. Or, I believe the concept has already been done before, is an assumption. And, I feel the logo doesn't express our brand the way we want, is an emotional response. By eliminating think, believe, and feel, we get statements of fact based on our knowledge or our experience. The colors are too bright. The concept has already been done before. And, the logo does not represent our brand. Another thing I taught myself is to replace a period in a sentence with a question mark. This changes a closed-ended statement into an open-ended discussion. Saying, the colors are too bright, might yield a defensive response of, no they're not, they're just fine. But by presenting the statement as a question, it opens the dialogue up for further exploration. Are the colors too bright to you? <laughs> is a softer way of suggesting our opinion while posing it as a question. Of course, respectfully acknowledging the opinions and decisions of others is always the best way to go. Whether we're professionals or just friendly observers, it's always important not to allow negative feedback to minimize the positive feedback. It's also important to be able to cherry-pick the usable information or truths from negative feedback, to recognize the truth and leverage it for our own benefit. Recently, someone posted a comment to one of my videos. And while I get feedback from lots of people, just like I leave feedback for other people, it's usually very positive and supportive. But sometimes people can be pretty negative. This one viewer started with positive feedback, but quickly turned negative. She wrote, 
I really like your videos and you draw really good, but you can be condescending to people who aren't so lucky to be born good at drawing and get a job doing art and make a lot of money to buy things they want so easy as you. I think you don't know how lucky you are. Maybe you should, so you know how hard it is for other people. Well, I could have just dismissed her comment and moved on, but for me, I chose to examine her words, and here's what I found. First, this woman seems to like my videos, and she seems to like my artwork. But she feels like I'm being condescending, and she believes I make a lot of money. She thinks things come easy for me because I was born lucky. After looking into her words, I see how things went sour, which is hard to respond to. The only thing to me worth taking away was that she felt I was being condescending. No one's ever called me that before, so I'm not sure where it came from. It's kind of like being called a bad driver by a bad driver. Her misconceptions of how hard I work, that I'm born lucky, or how much money I make, are nothing but assumptions. It's all based on how she relates how hard she works and how lucky she is and how much money she makes. In the end, I chose not to engage her because it's unlikely that anything I say will change her point of view. Another viewer used blame to rationalize why he would never be successful in his art. He wrote, I got an art degree 20 years ago, but when my wife got pregnant, I had to give up my dream of being an artist and get a real job to support my family. My kids are older, and I'm going to turn one of the bedrooms into a studio and try getting back into art, even though I'll never make a living from it. Looking closely at the words he used, we can gather some interesting facts. He feels he had to give up his dream of being an artist. He believes a job in art is not a real job, and he thinks he'll never make a living from his art. Breaking it down, it was clear he saw himself as a victim, blaming his wife and his kids for not being able to pursue his dream. Again, there wasn't much I could say to respond with beyond, good luck. These are just a couple of examples of the victim mentality, a negative personality trait found in many fields, especially art. Everyone is born into a range of circumstances, from poverty to privilege, good health to chronic challenges. But no one is born feeling victimized. That's a learned trait that develops from childhood. From my understanding, it starts at an early age from negative experiences, neglect, overindulgence, and even abuse. Now, as a personal disclaimer here, <laughs> I do not have a background in psychology or any medical field, so my perspective on this topic comes from my personal observation and my professional experience over 30 years and the ways I've found to understand and manage the victim mentality. We all come across this victim mentality, and often we're not even aware of it. It can affect us in different ways, especially over long periods of time. And that's what today's discussion is about, how to recognize this victim mentality, particularly with art, in ourselves and other people, and ways to keep it from dragging us down and interfering with our positive, creative spirit. Let's talk about this and more right after this coffee break. We go through life meeting all kinds of unique personality types. Most are familiar and share the same basic day-to-day -day experiences. Yet, there are those personalities we encounter that not only impact us, but may deeply affect us as well, both positively and negatively. Positive personality types are people who brighten our day or uplift us with compliments, by being helpful, or with a kind gesture. When someone lets us go in traffic, or hands us something we dropped, or even gives us a smile in the hallway at work or school. For me, positive types influence my whole day, so that I find myself paying it forward to other people. I relish those encounters, but I'm also well aware that nature has a way of keeping things in check, so that with every yang, there must be a yin to counterbalance it. And that's the negative personality type. People who bring us down with criticism, being unhelpful, or with unkind gestures. When someone cuts us off in traffic, or steps over that thing we dropped, or lets the door slam in our face at work or school. And the same holds true. We can actually pay that negative influence forward to other people as well. We all have days when things go right for us, and when things go wrong. And sometimes we take it out on other people. That's normal, and it happens to everyone. However, with the victim type, it can be tricky to navigate. When we're drawn toward negativity or being a victim, it can draw others into it as well, and even feed it. 
And like I said, from what I've learned about personality traits, the victim trait is usually something learned at an early age. I've read studies that show how positive interaction, music, and art can boost a child's cognitive skills. Yet, neglect, anger, and abuse can actually impede cognitive skills and contribute to dysfunctional coping methods at an early age. This victim mentality tends to see the good things that happen for other people as the reason for the bad things that happen for them, even if there's evidence to the contrary. The word victim itself means one who is harmed, tricked, or slighted in some way. Yet, there's another word, victor, as in victory. It means one who defeats an opponent, wins an event, or overcomes obstacles. So, while the victim type draws negative connotations, the victor type draws positives. But I should note, this is about a personality type, not someone who is a victim of a crime or an accident. That's a whole different thing. The victim type sees things and people around them as having a direct impact on their success, relationships, or happiness. They usually feel that they are subjected to bad luck, mistreatment, or missed opportunities through no fault of their own. And some victim types aren't even aware that they are victim types. They believe in their hearts that they are positive. For them, it can be extremely difficult to identify what's holding them back, and some never do. And for positive types, they can easily be drawn into the victim type's drama, the negative thinking, or blame. It can drag them down and drain their creative energy. It's important to be able to recognize the signs of a victim type when they enter our lives so we can avoid or work with or around them when necessary, and to recognize the signs within ourselves so we can catch them, move past, and present the best part of ourselves to enjoy the success and happiness we truly deserve. Here are some of the common victim types that I've come across in my own experiences and the signs I usually look for. The first is the cynic. This is the type of victim that only sees people as self-serving, no matter how generous they may seem. The cynic questions the sincerity of others and is always suspicious of ulterior motives. So, when good things happen for other people, the cynic usually scoffs at it or condemns it. If an actor gets a role because they may know the producer, the cynic will claim that it was favoritism. If a designer gets a job at a company where her brother works, the cynic will say it was nepotism. And sure, there may be truth in those claims, but the cynic will dismiss any real qualifications which those people possess to actually hold the job, all the years spent studying acting, and all the experience of being a professional designer. To the cynic, it becomes personal and justifies the reasons why they didn't get the job. It feeds the victim mentality by seeing something positive like generosity, good fortune, or hard work as being negative. There will always be situations where people get ahead because of someone they know. But to the cynic, it happens in all situations. Number two, misery enjoys company. You've probably heard the old phrase, birds of a feather flock together. This refers to like-minded people that gather together with shared interests and goals. It's true for both positive and negative people. I learned about this working in a small coffee shop back in art school. Lots of people would come in, grab their coffee or snacks, and just hang out. I got to hear all the latest gossip and goings-on while I worked cleaning tables and serving food. I noticed, though, that outside the regular crowd, there were two distinct groups that would come in day after day and linger a bit longer than everyone else. The first was an upbeat, positive group, always laughing and joking, talking about their projects and what was going on in the world. They were an uplifting and fun group and always left with a happy spirit. The second was a brooding group that would sit in the corner, complain about their projects, and commiserate about world events. They were somewhat depressing and always left with a heavy spirit. One shared a positive support system promoting success and finding solutions, while the other shared a negative support system lingering on apathy and identifying problems. The term misery enjoys company refers to people who are suffering and take comfort in knowing that those around them are suffering too. Number three, the glass is half empty. Years ago, I took a job as a lead designer for a small import company. Before I started the job, I studied their marketing materials to see what areas could be improved. On my first day, I met with my new creative team and I learned they'd been using the same materials for years. I presented my plan to develop fresh new concepts and revive the company's marketing image. After all, that's why they hired me. Well, my new team squirmed in their seats and looked around at each other. They didn't like the idea of creating a whole new body of work. 
They were comfortable using the same old designs year after year and were not interested in changing. One designer spoke up and said, Those have all been approved by legal. If we redo them, we're going to have to go back and have them all reapproved all over again. Another said, We've tried to make changes in the past, but marketing won't let us. They've been using these for years and they work. We don't need to change them. But then another said, What do you mean by fresh new concepts? I realized that two of the designers were stuck in the proverbial glass half empty way of thinking. They were afraid. One was afraid of wasting time and creating all new work only to be shot down by legal. The other was convinced that marketing would never go for new work and that there was no reason to change. Yet, the one who asked what I meant about fresh new concepts saw that there was room to grow. She saw the glass as being half full and she wanted to know more. She wanted to fill that glass with fresh ideas and she was excited by the prospect of new possibilities. Well, once we got to work and began developing new ideas, I was able to win marketing over. I promoted that designer who asked about new concepts and she produced some of our best new marketing materials. Later, when I decided to leave the company for another job, she was promoted to lead designer and we're still friends even today. When we see a glass as half empty, we only see what's missing and not the existing possibilities or opportunities. When we see a glass as half full, we can tap into what's there and expand on it, adding to what already exists. <laughs> Personally, I like the idea of a completely empty glass, which for me is actually full of potential and the opportunity to create something new from scratch. Number four, the world is against me. Growing up, Hollywood taught us that all we needed to succeed and be happy in life was a dream. Well, <laughs> it didn't take long to figure out that that was nonsense and it takes so much more to be successful. Skill, patience, perseverance, and a ton of hard work. That opportunities don't just present themselves, we have to hunt for them. I've always taught that you can't find opportunities in the grass on the front lawn. You have to look under rocks. And the heavier the rocks, the more likely you are to find opportunities. For some people, it seems like the world is working for them and life comes easy. Money, good looks, and success. Everything seems like life just handed it right to them. But for people like you and me, the world still offers opportunities. It just takes a lot of effort, sacrifice, and fortitude to succeed. Yet, there are still other people who never seem to get ahead. Some believe the myth that opportunities will just come to them with minimal effort on their part. Others work as hard as anyone else, yet the world just seems to always work against them. And when you feel like the world is working against you, you eventually just want to give up and stop trying. I mean, what's the point, right? It's the reason why so many people fall away from their passions and abandon their dreams of being an actress, a painter, a writer, or the next guitar hero jamming around the world. The thinking is that no matter how hard I try, the world is against me. That no matter how much work I put into something, I just never get ahead. And despite how much I want it, no one wants my work. And this can lead to all kinds of catastrophic negative thinking, like defeatism, envy, apathy, and fear, or creating severe conditions such as anxiety or depression, which unfortunately puts us even further away from our dreams and success. And it can also lead into number five, the blame game. Going back in time, I'm sure someone blamed the first cave painter for being a graffiti artist and making a mess all over the cave wall. And in religion, who do we blame for Adam and Eve being kicked out of the Garden of Eden? And who is to blame for breaking the elephant tusk off Ganesha, the Hindu god of wisdom, success, and good fortune? And in Buddhism, well, nobody gets away without blame. For me, I worked very hard to teach my young children not to blame others for things they did wrong. It worked well, and now that they're older, I'm proud that they take ownership of their decisions. With art, it's easy for people to place blame when things don't work out. It's the art teacher's fault for not showing us the right way to draw. It's the website's fault for not posting the correct information about a show. And it's the YouTuber's fault for recommending expensive products we ended up not liking. There's lots of ways blame plays into the arts. One job I worked at, I put in 14-hour days hoping to be recognized for a management promotion in my department. I had seniority and my boss was grooming me for the position. Then one day our company announced layoffs. Our department was safe, but others were not. Well, my boss had a friend in another department who was slated to be laid off. In an act of kindness, she saved her friend from being let go and brought her onto our team. The problem was, she gave her the management position I was being groomed for. 
I was pretty upset, and I couldn't help casting blame. I blamed my boss for hiring her over me. I blamed her friend for being unqualified and undeserving of the role. I even blamed the company for allowing my boss to hire someone unqualified for the role that I was qualified for. I was embarrassed because my peers knew what happened. I was angry because it meant both an advancement and a pay increase were now out of reach. And I was hurt because I felt betrayed by my boss. Before I had time to rationalize and accept the situation, my boss added insult to injury. She told me that training her friend was now my job and all my projects would now be under her. I went home and immediately searched for a new job. And fortunately, I got one very quickly, but needed to start right away. So I only gave a few days notice to my boss. She was furious that I gave her such short notice, blaming me that my decision to leave would severely impact the team's workflow. Well, it was sad to leave the company and the friends that I had made, but for me, I couldn't stay in a place that didn't recognize my abilities. It was a good decision for me, and I have no regrets. However, I wonder how many people experience the same kind of situations being victims of blame without being able to resolve it. Whether it's an artist blaming the quality of their tools for their own lack of skills, or a musician who blames the rest of the band when they're out of tune. Blame is an excellent way to defend ourselves and our abilities when we feel like we're being questioned or under attack. It's also a great way of getting out of doing extra work, getting in trouble, or being the target of negative attention. So, <laughs> the next time my kids track mud across the kitchen floor and no one accepts responsibility, I guess we'll just have to blame their shoes that apparently are walking through the house all on their own. Number six, excuses, excuses, excuses. We've all heard it over and over, either in our careers or in our personal lives. I want to play the guitar, but my fingers are too big. I want to learn how to draw, but I just don't have the time. And I want to exercise, but it's not possible with my medical condition. Well, there are a million two excuses for why we can't do the things we want to do, but don't. As I've said before, a discussion ends with a period, but opens with a question mark. We just have to change those statements into questions. How can I work my fingers to play the guitar? How can I find the time to learn how to draw? And how can I exercise despite my medical condition? Removing the mental limitation of what we can't do allows us to identify exactly what we can do. I had a college student who missed every other class. She'd come unprepared and never finished her assignments. Funny, but she always had plenty of excuses. My car broke down. I forgot my supplies at home. I felt sick and couldn't make it. On the last class before summer, she came in with her final presentation like everyone else. I was surprised because she'd missed so much, I was suspicious of what her work would be like. When she presented it, I was impressed. It was really, really good. Except, it wasn't hers. I asked her to stay after class, and I confronted her about her project. She swore up and down that it was her work, and she'd worked on it for weeks. The problem was that the drawing she presented was actually in an obscure history of illustration book that I had at home. And when I told her, you could see the tears fill in her eyes and her face turned red. She began to cry and blather, spouting all kinds of excuses that I wasn't expecting. She was in an abusive relationship, she just moved back in with her parents, she lost her job, and so on. To be honest, I would have felt bad for her if she had been a really good student, but she wasn't. I could tell that this was standard protocol for her, and it was probably how she went through life. Excuses, excuses, excuses. And in all the years I taught college courses, she was the only student that I ever failed. Now, don't get me wrong. There are always valid excuses for why we can't do things. But for me, these are reasons, not excuses. And to me, there's a big difference. It's when we use them as a crutch for why we aren't doing something we should or can, that's when it plays into the victim mentality. Several years ago, I underwent brain surgery, and it changed my life dramatically. But I try hard to never let that be an excuse for why I can't do something, except in certain situations. It's the whole reason why I can't do something. For example, I used to be an avid snowboarder. But after my surgery, I stopped because the risk of falling and injuring my head was too great. The problem was, my friends would invite me to go on a ski weekend, and I'd always say no. It took a really good friend of mine to finally say, hey, you know, you don't have to go snowboarding, but you can still come anyway. You can bring your art stuff, drink hot chocolate, and relax in the lodge, and afterwards, we can all hang out together. And he was absolutely right, and I've been going up to the mountains ever since. No excuses, and I'm always glad I go. Number seven, mountains out of molehills. 
Children love to catch each other making mistakes or doing something wrong. And when they do, they blow it all out of proportion like the world is coming to an end. Mommy, Daddy, Sam got ice cream all over the sofa. (laughs) They make a mountain out of a molehill to create more drama than is necessary to get a bigger reaction. And that reaction usually gets more attention, (laughs) especially for the kid who spilled the ice cream and who's now in big trouble. But while most kids grow out of this behavior, it can become a powerful tool for the victim type. At home, school, or in the office, some people get satisfaction in calling out the mistakes of others. And like a child, they blow them out of proportion to get attention. One woman I worked with was just like this. She spent a ridiculous amount of time actually looking for mistakes. And when she'd find one, she'd send an email to everyone demanding to know who made the error and why, stirring up our whole department. In reality, we're all human and prone to making mistakes here and there. So when someone does make repeated mistakes, it is important to look into in order to correct the problem. But this woman took it to a new level. She was hunting for mistakes and jumped on the smallest infraction made by the most astute artists. I finally had enough and replied to her email, suggesting that in the future she waste less time being a sleuth, looking for mistakes and trying to expose the people who made them, and spend more productive time into simply fixing the mistakes and moving on. Well, she didn't like my response and stormed around the office barking about how important it was to flag mistakes and keep them from happening again. Fortunately, the owner of the company got involved and sent us an email saying, Just do what Mark said and fix the mistakes, please. Making a mountain out of a molehill is the way a victim type elevates themselves above others, exploiting people's flaws and weaknesses, and making themselves seem more justified in their role and more important or impressive than they actually are. Number eight, it's all about me. In single point perspective drawing, lines recede back to a single vanishing point. With the all about me victim type, Single point perspective is when all focus and attention, negative or positive, go back to a single person. It's the inability to recognize the efforts or roles of other people and focus solely on our own efforts or roles as being most important. By making a situation all about me, we can end up pushing others away, drawing resentment and creating unnecessary drama around us. Most victim types that embrace this perspective are more often than not unaware they're even doing it. They see themselves as being team players, yet dominate conversations and turn the attention back to being about them or their work. If they're interrupted during normal conversation, they'll wait anxiously for a pause and then pick right back up where they left off. The it's all about me type becomes a victim when the focus on them suddenly shifts away and onto someone or something else. Oftentimes, they'll do whatever they can to make the situation come back to them again. You might see them laugh too loud, become agitated or critical, or even become hostile when others don't bring that single point perspective to meet their need for attention. I played in a band for a short time where our drummer would make things all about him. When he would make mistakes or couldn't remember his parts, he'd become agitated and complain that we were all off. When people would fixate on our lead guitarist and tell him how great he was, our drummer would say things to undermine him, like, yeah, he was good tonight, but you should have seen him last week. No matter whether we were playing or just hanging out after practice, he would always make the situation about him. And whenever it veered away, he would make a big stink to ensure the attention came back to him for better or for worse. Number nine, it's not fair. As kids, we're taught to share, be nice, and play fair, which is how we get kids to work cooperatively, communicate positively, and recognize honesty and civility. But kids learn quickly that when they do share, a lot of times other kids don't share back. That when they play nice with others, there are always kids who don't play nice and who are actually mean. And when kids play fair and by the rules, they see other kids who don't play fair get rewards while they get nothing. And that's when kids start the familiar cry, It's not fair. And what's ironic is that over time, adults change their tune and teach kids, you need to learn that life's not fair. (laughs) It can be really confusing. But kids see it in the classroom too. Some kids get privileges while others don't. Some kids wear expensive clothes while others wear hand-me-downs. And they see celebrities, politicians, and pro athletes break the law, lie or cheat, and not get punished. At a certain age, most kids do catch on that life isn't always fair. But there are some that don't. 
Whether it's because of coddling or sheltering, overindulging, or just plain ignorance, some kids begin to rely on it's not fair to get their way with adults who will equalize or balance things out to be fair. We've seen the term participation trophy go from being a positive reinforcement tool for kids who feel left out or unrecognized to becoming a negative connotation to reward kids who don't fully earn praise or accolades. The downside is that when someone claims it's not fair and demands that everyone gets equal acknowledgement, it minimizes the efforts of those who did earn acknowledgement legitimately through hard work and effort, putting everyone at vastly different skill levels on the same level. In the real world, especially in the creative fields, it can be difficult for less skilled artists to accept that their work is simply not as good as other people. No one wants to experience this, but it's a reality. It doesn't mean that the less skilled artist's work isn't good or deserving of praise. It just means that by accepting that the level of work we do, it will always have other work on either side of it. One that's better than ours, and one that's not as good as ours. And understanding this may help those who feel slighted or unrewarded from grabbing onto the phrase, it's not fair. These days, it seems a bit too common. It's not fair can also appear as, why not me, or how come they? It's a way of thinking where the victim type measures the good fortune of others against the lack of good fortune for themselves. Artists can be particularly susceptible to the why not me or how come they when it comes to the success of other artists. When two artists enter the same local show and one is chosen over the other, it draws the comment, well, why not me? It has precisely the same impact as it's not fair. And it happens in writing, music, athletics, and even in the corporate world. And finally, the one-upper. This might be the most annoying victim type. They can't resist the opportunity to outdo any story they hear. They're also known as conversation hijackers, braggarts, attention seekers, and name droppers. Their typical MO is to boast, brag, or tell stories to elevate their status among those around them. The result for them is to try and dispel any notion that they're boring, insignificant, or inexperienced. One can assume that there's some level of low self-image going on that draws a need to be bigger, better, or more valuable than anyone else. By exaggerating stories, taking over conversations, and outdoing anything anyone else presents, they reveal themselves as being obnoxious, unrestrained, or trying too hard to impress others. And usually, people see right through it. But for the one-upper, it's a volleyball game. So no matter what you put out there, they'll send it back bigger and better, even if it's completely false or ridiculous. The worst thing we can do when dealing with a one-upper is to not get caught up in the volley and try to one-up them. The best thing we can do is let them have their moment, be amazed, and, as I say, let the baby have their bottle. Because challenging a one-upper will only lead to truly negative results. So, in looking at a few victim types, do you recognize any? Is there someone that you know that these could apply to? Or maybe, if we're honest with ourselves, do these apply to us? What I wanted to know, and the reason I decided to make this video, is why would anyone want to become a victim? In my opinion, I don't think anyone really chooses to be a victim. I think there are reasons behind it. Being a victim lets us get what we want by playing off the reactions of others. It allows us to complain, which is like venting, and we're told that venting is supposed to be healthy. We can use deep sighing to bait others into asking, hey, what's wrong? Or are you okay? We can get out of obligations by saying, I can't, or I don't know how. It gives us a great excuse to do low quality work or no work at all. And it lets us blame others for our own shortcomings and provides a way to elevate ourselves over other people. At some point, everyone feels victimized, whether we're taken advantage of, ignored, or insulted. Being a victim type, we feel empowered when we have no power, and we can establish a position for ourselves where we had no prior status. But when that mentality becomes routine behavior, it's like relying on a crutch to walk, and life starts to happen to us, making it difficult to control situations or their outcomes. We see the world and people around us as luckier than we are, and that life is unfair. As I said at the outset, I'm not a professional in this field, but I just know from the research I've done and from the experiences I've had in my own life, both personal and professional. I don't know the root causes, and I don't know whether it's poor self-image, low self-esteem, or even a medical condition. But being able to recognize these victim types in others can be subtle and even tricky. 
The ten types I described here may make it easier to identify and understand. Still, if we feel that we can actually relate to those ten types, or that we drift toward being a victim type ourselves, there are a few good ways to steer out of it and maintain our positive course. The first way is if the problem is serious or chronic, it's always a good idea to seek professional medical advice. My neurologist recommended that I meet with a therapist to check in with, identify where I was at, and ensure that I was on task with my recovery and feeling good about life. I can't recommend personal therapy enough. A second way is to check out yoga or meditation. One doctor suggested I try yoga, but it really wasn't for me. However, he also suggested meditation, which I really took to and continue to do as part of my daily routine. It helps me regulate my breathing, my circulation, and sort out my thinking to clear stuff away that I don't need in my day. A third way is keeping a journal of victim moments. When situations come up and we say, it's not fair, or we make a mountain out of a molehill, we can easily send a text or email to ourselves and be completely honest about what happened and why. Then, we can track these incidents by keeping a journal, using our phone calendar or notes app, so that we might be able to recognize when we experience them and curb them in the future. Another way is to create two lists. One list is for things that trigger us, bother us, or get under our skin. The other list shows ways that we might be able to remedy these. For example, I hate when Joe at work gives everyone a high five and says, Great job, dude. He's such a phony. A remedy to this might be to cast a different light on Joe. He might be a phony, but he might also be doing what he does to stay positive for himself. And if people respond with smiles and high fives right back to him, it might be working. And that could be a trigger for any cynic toward him. One remedy could be to surprise Joe and offer him a high five and say, Great job, Joe, with a smile. And if we do it with a sincere, positive intent, I bet it will change our view of Joe just a little bit maybe enough to make it more tolerable. A fifth way is to plan your journey. As far as I know, we only get one shot at life. And I don't know about you, but I don't like being a bumper car, dizzily bouncing from obligations at home or school or work. Like when I go on vacation, I like to make a plan so I know what I'm doing. I like to have some wiggle room and enjoy my time. So this is our journey. So why not make a plan for it too? And I'm not talking about a grand plan. I'm talking about one thing, one objective. For me right now, I bought a graphic novel about six, seven months ago that I haven't read yet. It's my first graphic novel and I really wanted to sit and read it. I just haven't had the time. So this week, my plan has been to sit for one hour every day and read. So I set my alarm on my phone for six o'clock every afternoon and whatever I'm doing, I'll put it aside and go sit somewhere quiet and read. I'm thinking next week, if the weather's nice, maybe I'll go outside and paint for an hour, depending on how cold it is. But putting things on hold, like laundry, dinner, or bills, and spending just an hour doing something that I enjoy will keep me happy. And then I can bring that happiness into doing laundry, dinner, bills, or with the people that I'm surrounded with. Now don't get me wrong, I fall victim to being a victim type too. I get annoyed, I say it's not fair, and I one-up with the best of them. But the key is to recognize when it happens and work toward minimizing it so it's not a habit. And when it's against our nature to be happy and positive all the time, that's normal and that's okay, as long as it doesn't hold us back from what we really want to achieve in life. Well, I thank you so much for watching this video. I'm sorry it was so long, but I hope it was enjoyable for you and maybe even helpful. I'd love to hear your comments and thoughts below in the comments section, and if you'd like more content like this, please subscribe to the channel. Stay positive and keep exploring your creative world. Thank you again so much, and God bless.